Okay, so welcome back, everyone. Um, let's talk a bit about QMU storage daemon and libblock.io and the cool things that you can do with them. Um, my name is Kevin Wolf, um, and presenting with me is Stefano Garcella. Um, we're both working in the virtualization team of Red Hat. And I'll start off by talking about what we have today, like the traditional setup that we have with QMU that probably everybody here knows. Um, so the, the typical thing that, that you had is just you have one QMU process that emulates one guest. And um, some of these devices that the guest uses are this. Um, and the QMU process just accesses an image file to expose it to the guest. Um, you could have multiple VMs, of course, on the same host. Um, would just be a second QMU process that opens its own file. Um, over the time, we got a slightly less traditional use case um, where we had not only um, devices accessing the image file, but we also did some more um, advanced things inside of QMU with the, with the images that we have, such as um, the background block jobs that we introduced, um, for example, used in the case of um, live storage migration, um, or backups, stuff like this, um, for managing snapshots. Um, MBD client is used also in the context of, um, of storage migration. Um, but what's still the same thing here is you have one QME process, and um, that QME process has the image file that it accesses. And yeah, everything is in one process. Uh, it serves a single VM. Um, obviously, it's only available while the VM is running. Um, so you can't do run a block job while you don't have a VM running because it's tied to the same QME process. Um, when you want to share images between two VMs, for example, you have like a template um, that both VMs are based on. You can do that, um, but only as long as both QMU processes actually access it read-only. Because otherwise, if you modify a shared file, um, the other process wouldn't know that it actually has changed, so uh, it would cause corruption. Um, so that's what we used to have. Um, the new thing that we got, it's actually not that new anymore, um, per se. Um, QMU storage daemon has been in QMU for a while. Um, but it's only now like approaching the stage where you can do the really cool things with it. Um, so what is QMU storage team? It's basically you take the, the block layer from QMU and move it out into a separate process. Um, that's the, the basic idea behind uh, QMU storage team. Um, so uh, if you want to describe what QMU storage daemon is, you could approach it in two ways. You could either say it's QMU without the VM. You have just the, the storage things in it. And everything that is related to st storage um, that can be used in conjunction with the storage functionality, such as the, the QMP monitor, it's also present in, in the storage daemon. Um, or you could approach it from the other side and say it's, it's like an advanced QMU NBD uh, with the added monitor, with added Functionality like QMU MBD, for example, can share only a single image. Um, whereas uh, the QMU storage daemon can have as many images as you want, just like the real uh, QMU. Um, as I said, it, it supports the, the relevant subset of QMP, so it's everything that is related to VMs obviously doesn't work in, in QMU storage daemon, but it has all of the QMP commands to, to manage block devices, to start block jobs, all of these things. Um, you can see on the slide um, an example invocation of the QMS storage daemon. Um, it has the dash block dev option that you might know from QMU. It works exactly the same way. Um, and the dash export thing is something that we don't have in QMU because it's not the primary use case of QMU. It's running VMs. But, um, one of the primary use cases of the QMU storage daemon is actually to export the, uh, the block backend to be used by some other process, for example, by a QMU process. <coughs> so it's um, actually a separate command line option. 
So <clears throat> we can now change the traditional use case and do something like this instead. Um, it's basically the same as before, but the whole block layer has moved into a separate process. Now, why should we do that? <clears throat> and I have uh, uh, several reasons why you might want to do this. The first one is, is quite simply isolation. Um, like for security reasons, it's um, something you might want to just have more separation between all of the code um, accessing images um, and the code running VMs. Um, both sides need less privileges now. Um, like the storage side doesn't need all of the, uh, the functionality that is needed to, to actually run guests. It doesn't need access to, to the KVM, for example. And um, the QMU side doesn't need to, to access images anymore. Um, so if you ever have any security issue there, um, like um, it will be much more contained. So isolation is an, an interesting use case. Um, somewhat similar but different is like separation of concerns. Um, you could say that um, managing storage is one thing, running VMs is a different thing. You might not want to have the same component do both. And that is exactly the, the stance that um, Kubert takes. Um, they want to, to manage VMs, but storage is basically someone else's problem, and uh, that's someone else that uh, could be QMU storage daemon. It just does all of that and, and serves the the storage backend um, with all of the functionality that QMU could provide to something that cares only about the VM part of everything. <clears throat> um, this is another use case that we've had before. Um, imagine you start a block job, maybe to do a backup while the VM is running, and now you're shutting down the VM. Uh, traditionally, this means that you have to cancel the block job and your backup is, like, it just isn't completed, so you have to restart the next time. Um, that's not actually what you want. But if you have the storage daemon running um, in a separate process, um, you can just shut off the, the VM, but the backup job keeps running. In the same way, if you start the backup while the VM is down, you, you could uh, start the VM and attach it to the storage daemon that is already running for the backup job. So um, we can have some interesting features there. <clears throat> okay, after the use case that didn't use any QME at all, or sometimes any QME at all, um, what we can also do is we have a single process, a single QME storage daemon that serves multiple VMs. So um, where before we only had one QMU process accesses one file. We can now um, have multiple VMs that access the same storage team, and that um, brings also a few interesting advantages. Um, in the beginning, I mentioned the case where you share a backing chain, like you have a, a single template that multiple VMs are based on, um, and where the, the backing chain is, becomes essentially read-only because otherwise you get corruption. Um, if you have a QMU storage daemon in between that opens it, um, then you can modify the backing chain as you want. For example, delete a snapshot from it, and it just works. You can share a CPU for polling, which is something you might want to do in a low latency use case. So you want to get um, high performance. And um, So essentially, you set a CPU aside um, per IO thread to, to pull um, for event completion. And um, <clears throat> now you can have a, a single IO, th IO thread that serves multiple VMs, actually. So you don't have to set aside a whole CPU for multiple VMs, uh, a whole CPU for each VM, but you can use one for multiple of them. You could share uh, a single hardware device uh, among several VMs. For example, it could be um, you have a, a single NVMe disk. Um, you want to use the user space driver in QMU, but you can only like, open that device once. If you had to attach it to the QMU process directly, only one of them could have it. 
Um, but if you open it in a QMU storage daemon and then let all of the QMU processes access the QMU storage daemon, now this becomes possible. And finally, use case, um, we could also attach things to things that are not virtual machines. Um, like uh, we have different export types, and I'll come to that in a second. Um, but for example, we have a, a fuse export type which allows you just mounting it to the host and using it from the host. Or you could um, attach directly to application that uh, natively speaks the vhost user protocol, things like that. <clears throat> um, obviously, that also directly applies to containers because if you, you know, if you can have them on the host, um, you can have them in containers too. So, let me give you a short introduction of the different uh, block export types that we support in QME Storage Daemon. So, the oldest one that probably most people know is NBD, the network block device. Um, it exports the storage over network, over TCP connection, or over a Unix domain socket, that's possible too. Um, has existed for many years in QMU already, and it's, it's actually the usual thing that you use when you um, do live storage migration without shared storage. Um, it's not really a high performance protocol because it involves like copying the data around over the network even sometimes. Um, so it's, it's definitely not zero copy. So it comes with some uh, performance cost, but um, yeah, it has been in wide use for, especially in the context of storage migration. Then we recently, recently I think means QME 6.0, uh, recently got the, the Fuse export type, which takes an image and mounts it on the host as a single image file. So, for example, you can open a QCOW2 file in the storage daemon and export that as a Fuse file. Um, and that file essentially looks like a raw image that has the content of the QCOW2 image that you open in the storage daemon. So, um, this is the export type that you might want to use with anything that doesn't know anything about images, disk images, about VMs. Um, like, we have not really optimized this yet. Uh, it's working, but it's still fully synchronous, so um, still some work to be done there. Then we have vhost user block, and that's um, basically the high performance thing that you can use to connect um, a guest to QMU storage daemon because um, the, the guest device basically talks directly to, um, to the QMU storage daemon um, using the shared memory of, of the virt queue. Um, the QMU process is only involved for setting everything up and then it's just a shared memory between the storage daemon and the guest with uh, QMU not involved at all. So um, that's the, the best case that you can have for, for performance. Um, when you use this and you have further block in, in the guest, um, essentially you don't lose any performance by, uh, by moving things out into a separate process. Because whether it's, it's handled by the QMU process or the QMU storage daemon doesn't really matter as long as you don't like add another um, step in the path. And finally, we have a fourth export type, which is VDUs. Um, and that exports uh, QMU block backend as a VDPA device. Um, Stefano will talk a bit more about uh, VDPA in general, what it is and how it works. Um, right, and I think with that, I'll hand over to you. Okay. Thanks. As Kevin just presented, um, the QMU storage daemon has several exports. I'm focusing now on VOST user block and VDUs. Uh, in, in both cases, uh, the, the QMU storage daemon emulates a virtual block device. So the guest must support virtual block driver. So in this scenario, the QMU block layer, layer is completely bypassed since the guest is talking directly with the device. And, but if the, the guest does not support a virtual block, QMU 
could emulate an ID disk, for example, but to do that, need to access the device. So uh, the QEMU block layer needs a Vertio block driver to access the Vertio block device emulated by the QEMU storage daemon. And this, one, this was one of the use cases that motivated us to develop a new library called libblock.io. Uh, I will not go into details because next Wednesday, Stefan and Alberto will talk more about the libblock.io API, its use cases, and the supported drivers. I really suggest to follow it to understand better libblock.io. As a highest level overview, libblock.io is a new library that provides a single API for efficiently accessing block devices. It's written in Rust, but it exposes also a C API for C application like Emu. And among the supported drivers, we just have Vertio block, which is what we need to get Emu block layer to talk to QSD when it emulates an, a Vertio block device. So libblock.io, I mean, the application can use libblock.io API to access Vertio block devices. The configuration and data path are completely abstracted by the library. And the library allocates the vert queues. So every request queued through the libblock.io API will be directly queued into the vert.io block device. So there is, I mean, application do not need to implement the vert.io block driver to re-implement it. And, but it, it can use the, the library to do that. So uh, libblock.io supports several transport for the vert.io block driver. We have, for example, the Vertio block vhost user driver that uh, implements a vhost user front end to communicate with the vhost user back end like the QEMU storage daemon. And it also provides a Vertio block vhost VDPA driver to access VDPA devices using the vhost VDPA interface, which we will see later. So going back to the example we, we saw before, now QEMU uh, can use libblock.io to talk with the QEMU storage daemon. And then we can use the, the QEMU block layer and for example, emulate an ID disk to guess that does not support Vertio block. We, we already mentioned VDPA when we talked videos. Now let's take a closer look to understand how libblock.io helped us to use the VDPA devices with the QEMU block layer. So VDPA means Vertio Data Path Acceleration. It was originally designed for, uh, to accelerate Vertio devices in hardware, where the data path must be fully compliant with the Vertio specification, and the control path could be vendor specific. On top of the VDPA framework in the host kernel, we have two ways to access the VDPA devices. We call them VDPA bus drivers. The first one is vhost VDPA, which is, uh, I mean, uh, it is based on the vhost kernel interface, providing additional IOCTLs to, to allow full control of the device. So in this way, the whole device is under control, the user space application, and it's the best interface for VM workloads. The second bus driver is called Vertio VDPA, and it allows to attach a VDPA device directly into the host kernel. So, and for example, in the case of VDPA block device, a Vertio block driver is loaded inside the host kernel to handle the data path and connect the VDPA device with the Linux block layer. In this way, application running in the host or inside the container can use the VDPA, can access the VDPA device through the block device exposed by the, the Linux kernel, for example, in slash dev slash VDA. You can find more information in at uh, vdpa-dev.gitlab.io. So uh, as we already saw, VDPA was, uh, was designed for hardware accelerators. In, in this case, the vert queues are processed directly by hardware, providing the best possible performance. Example are the SmartNICs, where in addition to providing network offloads for TCP IP stack, now they are also able to emulate a Vertio block device to accelerate network block protocols, such as Safari BD, iSCSI, on, or others, depending on the vendors. The only required driver in this case is a, a small driver in the host kernel for the control path. For the data path, uh, everything should be there, since must, uh, the data path must be fully compliant with the Vertio specification. 
BDPA allows us to develop also software device in user space, as Kevin mentioned, using videos. Videos is an additional kernel model that provides an API to, to emulate um, devices in user space. And then the device is attached to the VDPA framework and exposed as a regular VDPA device. So um, it's almost very similar to VHost user. The main difference is that thanks to the VDPA bus drivers, we can use uh, the VDPA devices with both VMs and container workloads. The last type of devices that we can develop with VDPA is uh, software device, I mean, software accelerators in kernel, which is very similar to vhost, uh, but the advantage here is that we can reuse all the software stack we are developing for VDPA for all the kind of uh, accelerators we are seeing. So hardware, software in user space, and in kernel. All the software stack starting from the kernel to uh, libblock.io, qemu, and libvirt will be the same. And we can use the, the in-kernel software accelerator when we want high performance, but the, the hardware does not support VDPA. So going back to libblock.io, uh, it allows us to use the VDPA devices in the same way we saw for vhost user device. So uh, the qemu storage features will be available for all the VDPA devices. And Qemu, for example, can emulate any block device. But when we use, uh, we, when Qemu emulate um, a VertIO block device, we have two vert queues involved. One between the guest and the guest driver and the Qemu device, and one between libblock.io and the VDPA device, which is why we call this scenario slow path as opposed to the fast part where we can have a single vert queue directly by the guest and the driver. Sorry, the guest and um, the guest driver and the VDPA device. So the slow path is almost ready thanks to libblock.io, while the fast path is um, among our future plans. So our idea is to extend the libblock.io API to provide uh, a vert, uh, I mean, to enable the vert queue pass-through. So if the QEMU block layer is not needed, uh, for example, because the VM is not using any of its features, the guest vert queues can be exposed directly to the device. And this will work for both VDPA and VOST user devices. We would also like to provide an automatic mechanism in QEMU to do the switch between fast and slow path at runtime. This because several uh, features like IO throttling, live migration may be required while the VM is running. So summarizing our future plans, we'll, we, will should, we will shortly try to, to implement the, vert, the vertio pass-through in libblock.io and QEMU. About the storage daemon, we would like to support it in libvirt, and we will also explore potentially alternative implementation, maybe based on Rust, reusing the native Rust API provided by libblock.io. And about uh, the VDPA in kernel software device, uh, we, we realized the proof of concept that showed very good result. It was based on the VDPA simulator, so still required a bit of work to be, to be completed. So that's all for, for us, and should we have some time for questions? Yes, I mean, obviously there are security implications like they share the same state. So um, if something goes wrong, basically the user of one VM can access the storage of the other one. Like if you have a security problem. So that's something you need to take into account. Um, I think in many cases it actually doesn't um, really matter that much. I mean, if the VMs belong basically logically to the same user, um, it's maybe not that bad. Also, these use cases are often related to like uh, performance um, use cases, like scenarios where you need high performance, where maybe um, the isolation aspect is not that important. Yeah, but definitely something to take into account when you're setting up your, your uh, configuration. One question there. Did you have a chance to play with 
No, we haven't actually uh, done anything with uh, SecComp yet. Um, I mean, usually the um, restricting QMU um, is something that Lippert uh, is the level that Lippert is doing. Um, this is something that um, enables Lippert to do this um, like more specific, in more specific ways than we currently are doing. Um, but we're not actually um, exploiting the, the opportunity yet. Are there restrictions on the chaos type system you can run on it? And I'm thinking in particular regarding uh, uh, user IDs and things like that. How do you map them to this concept? Um, so this question was about file systems, um, how we map users and, and things. Like, we don't because this is just the block layer. Um, so we we're, we're don't have actually files, we have block I, devices. I don't think that, I, I don't think that you know, I'm going to do some file systems on top of that, for example. Right, so but. Does point if I need to sync my user ID with my user list within the file system? Uh, I think you're probably thinking about sharing the same file system between multiple VMs. Like, that's basically a, a setup where you would use uh, something like cluster file system, and obviously um, they would require some way to, to sync this, yes. So you can run this kind of thing? Also yeah, but you could, in theory, run a, a cluster file system on this. Um, you, it's, you actually could that, do that before, because the cluster file system does all of the work of, of synchronizing things. So you could um, have a single image before and let just um, different chemical processes access it, read, write. Um, so that was possible before. Okay, so the question was, how does this compare to VFIO VFI user um, and moving devices out that way? Mm, they are different in a way that, um, like VFIO moves the whole PCI device out, right? And, and we're moving the back end out. So um, I wouldn't say that they're alternative approaches to the same problem. Um, maybe you could even combine them like have the, the separate out PCI device still access the storage daemon. That could maybe serve multiple devices then in this case, um, instead of multiple VMs. So I think it, it just combines well together as well, yeah. The, the question was how to compare vhost device with VDPA in kernel devices, right? Yeah, we expect very similar performance. So, um, for example, for block, we never had vhost block merged, so now it makes sense to, do, to use VDPA because we can reuse all the stack. So, in theory, it should be very similar as performance. It's totally advantage to reuse the software stack we are developing for both hardware accelerators and software accelerators. Uh, is there any security implications to be using uh, the VDPA that you have to you know, buff the buffer? Yeah, maybe cool. Uh, but I mean, it was like a, a device for the perspective of the user, so we would like to be sure that everything will be right. So yeah, time is pretty much up. Um, so if you have any more questions, just catch us outside in, in the hallway. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>